we begin? Hello. Hello, Ricardo. How are you? Um, Will you come in for the first five minutes? So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Simon T, and I'm here to seduce you. With the idea of design thinking, the idea of innovation, because what you are going to experience in the next two hours is how to think like an innovator, how to think like a designer, and how to bring people back into the world of how you think about products, experiences, and all the rest of those good things. Because the essence of design thinking is thinking from a people perspective, your perspective. How many commodities, products, experiences do you have every day that just frustrate you? They're poorly designed. They didn't think about people. They thought about the product, not you. That's what we're going to be talking about. So welcome to that. So what are we talking about? We're going to be talking about innovation, what it means around innovation. It's not just a buzzword. It's a way to embrace change. It's a way to embrace how you rethink products, experiences, your life, your business models, all of those things. So let's start humbly with this, and a little bit of a definition of what innovation is. There's a thousand constellations of, uh, of ideas and definitions. Here's humbly one. It's just about ideas. It's about generating lots and lots of creative ideas. But ideas alone mean nothing without action. So what it is, is taking an idea and turning it into something, something with action. That's the key, something you can touch and feel, an experience, a product, whatever it may be. You have to turn it into something, take action. So design thinking is about taking action with ideas. But just because you have an idea that's turned into something doesn't mean people want it. So the last key thing when you think about innovation is this, value. Value to whom? It has to have value to people. They must be able to see the value. They must be able to want the value, maybe even buy the value. We've all seen products that nobody wants. So the art of innovation is finding those gaps, those niches, those moments, the things that are getting in the way of people and finding solutions, humble or huge, to them. That's what innovation is, and that's what we're going to be talking about. And again, my name is Simon T. I'm the Chief Innovation and Open Assets Officer at Fanshawe College. I'm rather new, like many of you might be. But that's what we're going to be talking about today. Anyone got the wrong room? It's happened before, trust me. People have walked into the wrong room, thought it was a math class, that kind of stuff. Okay, so let's dive in. My job today is very humble. My job today is to be your personal arsonist of change. That's it. If you want to become an innovator, you have to inspire the people around you, inspire them with your creative ideas. My job is to ignite that passion. Set your ideas alight. Change the world with your ideas. That's what I want to do. It doesn't matter what I say. Hopefully, you'll get some ideas, some Great inspiration from today, but it's about your ideas and putting them into action. They can be monumental or mouse size. It does not matter. Innovation is all scopes and scale. But it is about you inspiring yourself, your team, the people around you, your peers, to create something monumental. That's what we're doing. So we're going to be talking about design thinking. Sounds like a buzzword, doesn't it? Design thinking. But design thinking is essentially this. It's taking the elements of design and how you design products and literally supersizing that as a way of thinking to solve all problems, problems that involve people. You are a person, technically, and you know people, and you know problems that people have in their lives. Design thinking is the glue that helps you unlock solutions that actually make a different difference in people's lives. 
what it essentially humbly does is this. It puts people back in the core of problem solving. So you're just not a byproduct of what happened. You're at the heart of the solution. People are at the heart of the solution. How you think about a problem, you walk in their shoes, you walk in their mindset, and you create more dynamic solutions. It's also known as like human-centric design. Yeah, that's another way of thinking about it. But it's essentially this. It's about problems. Remember what I said about innovation? It's not just creativity. It's about taking them and turning them into action and then making something of value. So you have to identify problems. Problems you see. Problems you hear about. Problems you, you know, touch in your lives. Problems. Design thinking is being used for many companies, Airbnb, the famous kind of hosting company, they say that it helped them refine their idea of what their company was. A lot of companies have used this for technology, smartphone development, those kinds of things, making it more user-friendly by understanding people, hands, solving problems. But there are other areas where it's being used as well. It's, yes, there's technology. That's often common. It's been used in healthcare. Think about people, sick people, patients, understanding their journey, their experience, and how you can improve that experience and make it more profound, but actually have the better outcomes as a result. It's been used by governments to rethink big services, how you deliver services to lots of people be it niches or broad services. It's being used by banks. It's being used by big service companies to understand your journey through their products. It's being used in all of these ways. It's been used by non-for-profits, the public sector, the private sector. It's been used a lot. It is a toolbox, a way of thinking that helps you thrive as an innovator. That's honestly why you're here. Isn't it? Because you want to know about innovation and be even even better innovator. Turn your creativity into ideas, those actions, into something of value. So if that's where it's being used, where did it come from? So the origins of all things have stories. Uh, IDEO is a famous Californian design company that did design, traditional type design. But increasingly, clients came in public sector, private sector, government, clients came in and said, could you rethink this using your design techniques in different ways? And they said, okay, we'll give it a go. And they rethought different experiences, different ways people interacted it by understanding people and incorporating people into the way they thought and designed the eventual product. So if you think it's about people, you've got to understand people. And the fact is, you're not frozen in time. Not yet. You're not frozen in time. You have needs. Don't you? You have different kinds of needs. You have different kinds of needs at different stages of your life. Your needs shift. All people's needs shift. Sometimes because of external events. Sometimes because of life choices you've made. Your needs shift. That big basket of all the needs you are shift. And it shifts because of, I don't know, work changes. We've now moved into hybrid remote work. Work changes. Your career may shift. What your aspirations may shift. Your needs as a result shift. As you grow in your career, your needs shift. It can grow as a result of age. Your needs at 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 can be very different. Needs for care, needs for support, needs for community. It could be the different stages in your family. As it grows, as it expands, what their needs are. And it could be on different needs as a consumer. As you go through your life and change what it means and what you need to live a successful and humble but also happy life. So if your basket of needs shifts and you're that dynamic, so is everyone else. And so when we think about design, we have to understand that people are fundamentally dynamic and their needs shift and they map differently at each point in their lives. How many of us play different roles? Family member, leader, innovator, student, whoever. You play different roles. And you have different needs, and the people around you have different needs in those roles. It's a shifting pattern. So 
what is the design thinking process? What is that process that kind of stitches all this together? It's really humble these five steps. It really is. It starts off with the idea of empathy, knowing people, knowing what motivates them, knowing their aspirations, the barriers, the frustrations they have, knowing people, knowing what's stuck in, in front of them right now. Then it's a question of then when you think about defining the problem. You can't solve, boil the ocean, you, but you can boil a part of it. Defining the real problem that they need solved today. So defining that problem, refining the problem, getting a better question to answer. Then it's about exploding the possibilities, ideating, coming up with lots of ideas about how we possibly can solve that, opening the aperture. How many times we sell, sell, try to solve the same old problem the same old way and get the same old result? So it's about exploding the possibilities, not confining them, and seeing, is there a different way we can do that today? Maybe technology's changed. Maybe our communities change. Maybe the culture's changed. And we can solve that in a fresh, new, novel way today. And then it's about prototyping. When you've come up with an idea, remember I told you ideas have to turn into action. How do you prototype something, a rough and ready solution, just to give it a go? See what works, what doesn't work. Before you spend a fortune designing something fancy, let's get some cardboard out and design something rudimentary. Test it with people. Test it with, does it work? Does it overcome what you really needed to be solved? And ultimately, if you've got something you think is kind of viable, let's take it out to the world and see what we can do. Does it really meet the needs of people today? So if that's the design process, and you're thinking, okay, well, we talked about this is all about smartphones and fancy things and electronic gadgets. It's really not. It can be used to think about profound problems that afflict our world, tragedies that afflict our world. As you know, across the globe today, there's many people who are fleeing from the lives from conflict, from natural disasters, and all sorts of terrible tragedies. Many of these people end up being refugees. Families are running for their lives, finding shelter somewhere else, a safe harbor somewhere else. For many of these people, where do they end up, these families? They end up in refugee camps. Honestly, cities that literally appear overnight. Some have thousands, tens of thousands of people in them, families in them. Now, most refugee camps, as you can see, Literally, and by the way, literally, people can be in these camps for years, weeks, months, years. Most refugee camps are designed on this kind of rigid box fashion, right? All rigid like design, like box fashion, dun, 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 in lines, sorted out like boxes. Why? Because it's easy, right? It's easy to design that. You can knock it up quite quickly. You can put the tents up really quickly. And, you know, literally, there's hundreds maybe even thousands of tents, all lined up in rows. Where does that come from? Anyone take a guess? Where does that design come from? It comes from the military. Often these camps are built by the military as part of responding to a natural disaster. What is the military really good at? Logistics, speeds, and getting things done. They build an imitation of a military camp. All the tents are in line for all the soldiers to go in. What, is it, what do you know about most soldiers? They're young people, 18, 22. Right? They're young people, men and women, young people. What do they do all day? Well, they have somebody who gets them up early in the morning. They train, they do things. They have communal mess halls to eat. And when they're exhausted at the end of the day, they fall into one of those tents. It's not a fault of the military when they build these camps because they build quickly, fast, to accommodate a flood of people on your doorstep. But does that actually meet the needs of refugees and families? It's designed for a young person who is entirely occupied all day. So a different way to think about this from a human perspective, a design perspective, is think about, well, what does a, fa a refugee family look like? They look like people like you. 
They could be mom, dad, some kids. They could be extended family, cousins, uncles, aunts, you name it, and their kids. That's what a refugee family looks like. Do they really want to be slotted into one of those tents? Does that work? A different way to think about this is think about, well, what happens if we just put the tents in a circle? And suddenly, what you've created is a mini, micro kind of community. Family, extended family. There's a place for the kids to play safely. By the way, those, those linear camps have problems with violence, family reunification, and other problems of getting services to people. Here you have a little space for people, a communal space for that family, that extended family, in there. And if you think about that and designing that and supersizing that to a camp, you've got lots of extended families. It doesn't mean you're replacing, you're trying to replicate the community experience because this is how a community is formed. Now, some of you might think, okay, this is kind of starry-eyed stuff. But here's the Architect Society, Hex House. They've actually done this as MIT students and actually designed these kind of hexagon kind of prefab houses that we use for disasters, refugees, when you need to house a lot of people quickly. But you can clearly see how there's has that kind of courtyard in the middle and that sense of community that you can build. In other words understand the people and design up from them rather than just imposing a solution upon them. And if you think about that, okay, you think, okay, that's a wild example from a world away. If you think about how we design suburban developments, what is it? A series of boxes in a row. And then people complain there's not really a sense of community. In other words, Design impacts community, impacts people. So we can actually rethink how we impact people by rethinking our design and then the impacts we have. That's how this tool can be profound, if you think about people. So let's start with empathy. Empathy is the ability, very humbly, to walk in someone's shoes. But it's more than that. A lot of people talk about walking in their customers' shoes going through the journey, buying the product just like they would. But is that enough? Is that enough? If you really want to have a deeper, richer understanding, you might actually want to go the next level and actually think about, think about people from an emotionally intelligent level. Think about what's in their heart. What, are, what is you know, their head? What is their rational decisions, the decisions they're making? What is in their heart? What are the emotional factors in their decision making? Everybody uses their heart and their head to make decisions. You're not that rational, you use emotions. But you also use your gut. Anybody here has bought something on the off chance? A gut response? So if you understand people not just as a price point and a consumer, but understand them as the full person, you can design something that is more profound, a better solution. And if you really want to supersize this, you can go out and interview people. You can do research, or you can simply open your eyes and observe people. Observe people trying to use something or go through an experience or, or, and are getting frustrated throughout that experience. What are they getting frustrated with? No one will answer my question. I have a simple question. No one will answer it. So if you really want to supersize that empathetic, that observational, type innovating skill, humbly listen. Listen to what they're saying. If six people repeat the same question, it tells you you haven't explained what you're doing. Listen to what they're saying. What are their problems? What are the challenges they're experiencing in that experience with that product, with that service? Because if you, if you catalog or listen to all those problems, you can understand what the pain points truly are. How, what do they say? How do they say it? What emotion do they express? Are you deadpan all the time? Are you frustrated, angry, happy, joyous? So how do they speak? What do they say? What are the words they use to explain the challenge, the problem? You can actually, you can actually listen to that and those words they speak. What is it they see when they walk through that service? They get the box in the mail. They the achieved, whatever it may be, what do they see as they walk through the building? 
what do they actually physically see? Or do they get totally confused and lost? Because if you're not walking around with their eyes on, how can you design a solution for them? What do they touch? Trust me, you touch lots of things. You, maybe as many of you are touching the desk now or the sandwich or the Coke can. What are you touching? We interact with objects. How do you interact with an object or, or a thing or a product or a service? Understand those questions from all senses. And honestly, smell. Sounds really thing. Really? You think smells are relevant? How many times do you equate quality with smell? Go into a coffee shop. What does it smell of? Coffee. What did you come in for? Coffee. Are you going to leave now because your brain's been triggered with the smell of coffee? That you want coffee? Smells are important. Does the pl place smell clean and fresh? Or does it smell dirty? If you don't think that's important for certain like experiences, hospitality experiences, hospital experiences, you don't think that smell matters, you're missing a piece of the jigsaw puzzle. You're not thinking about the whole human, you're just being selective about parts of the human. Let's take some humble examples. If you actually look at the adult population, currently in Canada, and it's roughly the same across most Western jurisdictions, about 1 in 40, 1 in 45 adults have an intellectual impairment due to aging, Alzheimer's, dementia, those kinds of things. Okay? About 1 in 45. So in a large lineup, like at a Costco on a Saturday, there's probably one person who's in that bucket. Throw the stone forward. We live in an aging society, and that goes below 30. I think it goes down to like 28, something like that. 28 out of 100. That might be every lineup you're in. So it's a growing problem. So go back to that idea of seeing with people's eyes. Who's ever been to a hospital here? Probably have. Let's be honest. At least once you've been to a hospital. Or long, if you've ever been to long-term care. They are clinical. Are they not? Sterile, clinical. They have to show you where to go because everything looks the same. They design it to look, everything look the same. So one of the problems when you think about it, and you're capable adults, imagine being an adult, a senior with dementia or Alzheimer's trying to find your room. You can read a number and remember the route back. Can they? So this really cool project which was done, they call it True Doors. You can look it up on the website, it's a phenomenal project. All they do, and it just shows you that innovation doesn't have to be technological wizardry. Sometimes it's very humble if you walk in people's eyes and see the world in their eyes. All they did was when they had a new resident who had dementia or Alzheimer's, they would go to their home and they would take a photograph of their front door. And they would turn it into a sticker. So this person has seen that front door for 10, 20, maybe 30 years. And they would put the sticker on their door in the hospital, in the long-term care home. And people can find their own front door. Is it a perfect solution? No. Is it a better solution? Yes. And, you know, people take pride in the fact they know that it's their room. They get a sense of possession. They know where to find their room. It's theirs. It gets away from that sense of being in a clinical setting where everybody is anonymous. It just shows you stickers and photos can transform people's lives by a crumb, by a margin. So we are going to break into breakout sessions. On your tables, there should be roughly about four to a table. If you want to move, you can always do that. What I would like to do is just a five-minute exercise to get into this idea of the first stage of this, which is the empathy question. Understanding people from all aspects. What I would like to do is we've all come out of COVID. Hopefully, we're out of the journey out of COVID. What I would like to do is on your tables discuss from your perspective, your own reflections, your people. You've done this. You've lived this. Is when we think, 
when we've gone through COVID, how can we re-engage you? How can we re-engage you on campus in the student life? What would it take? Just jot down some ideas. For those people in, uh, in the brocade sessions online virtually, again, you're going to be divided up in a moment. Just come up with some ideas. What do you need to feel a reattachment to this community? Because we've all been isolated for so long. What do you need? You can share whatever you want, but what are some things you need from a human perspective? It's not a policy procedural. It's a human perspective. What do you need? Okay? Sounds good? If you're sitting by yourself, you might want to move at this stage. It's always a bit of a boring conversation by yourself. Okay, so I'm going to give you about seven minutes. It might be five because I might want to move quicker because we started late. Ideas.
Okay, let's come back. I know I was cheating with you around the time. I was just trying to pressure you a little bit. So let's just come from the tables. Any ideas you had from your perspective, the journey you have been on? We've got some chat going, which is people thinking about hybrids. People have thought about transport difficulties and how they've had some challenges. But how can I re-engage you? Silence is not golden. It's not even bronze. I know you're capable of speaking. What ideas do you come up with? Go ahead. Okay. Great insight. So again, that sense of being gradual to get people gradually readjusted to being social. Fabulous suggestion. At the back. Sure. So the comment, first comment was that maybe there should be a gradual kind of progress around events so that people get a comfort level with being around people and socializing. At the back. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, wonderful statement. So if I could encapsulate that, we are all a product of our experience. Some of us have been in different kinds of communities our entire lives, sporting communities, social communities, all sorts of communities. And we have to understand that the people are coming from different perspectives. Some have a wide array of community, some much more narrow. So when we think about reintegrating and bringing people back together and re-engagement, we have to be aware of those differences across. Anyone else? The 30 seconds of brilliance starts now. Go ahead. Free food always helps. Absolutely, especially donuts at the back. Free food, yes, you have to have a hook to bring people in. That's key to any engagement, right? What is the hook? Go ahead. Oh, cool. Okay, so study sessions after class to give people to actually reconnect. The time beyond just being sitting next to each other, but actually connecting with each other after class. Excellent ideas. Is there anyone from the chat? Yep, yeah, okay, there's chat around different experiences. How do we actually get lots of experiences, lots of opportunities for people to connect? So again, understand there's such a breadth of different people. We actually have to understand people when we actually think about engagement and when we think about culture. It's not just, here's the poster. Okay, let's move on to define. Defining the problem. Because you can solve any problem but the question is, are you solving the right problem? Some problems are easy to solve. What do you want for lunch? Well, they can be really profound. The key is to actually define the problem. What really is the problem that's getting in our way? And there's lots of tricks to this, but it's essential that you spend time at the front end really getting clarity about what you're trying to solve. Don't take my word for it. Please do not take my word for it. Here's Albert Einstein. Coming up with a problem is often more difficult than finding the solution. It's actually the clarity of the challenge that helps you come up with the right solution. So it's, again, spend time at the front end really understanding what problem we're trying to solve so we can come up with innovations and ideas turn to action that actually help us achieve those goals. So it's about the questions you ask to define the problem. So here's an interesting one. What problem do people want solved? We often assume we know the answer, but do we actually know the problem they actually want solved? Give you a real humble idea. This is pasta sauce. Tomato sauce, pasta sauce, whatever your preference is. 
You've seen it in the supermarket. There's a row of it. And you think you select, you select the sauce you like, you take it away off the shelf, you buy it and take it home and make pasta, spaghetti, or whatever it may be. Think about this from the empathy point of view. There are many seniors, they've done studies of this, who will choose the brand not based on how it tastes, not necessarily the price, but how easy it is to get open. So all these people design the sauce, make the sauce, bottle the sauce, alter the standards, la di diddly diddly dum, package the sauce, move the sauce with the truck on a truck, off a truck, onto the shelf, and people aren't buying it because they can't get the wretched top off the sauce. No one thought about the last step, the people at the end of the process. If I can't get the sauce open, I'm not going to buy your sauce. Here's another one. This is the famous iMac. This is this, the product that relaunched Apple. This is when Steve Jobs first rolled out of a great product that you know, came before the iPods and the iPads and the iPhones. Relaunched Apple. What was different about it? It was colorful. Most computers that before that were ugly and gray and dull. You could look inside it, change the game. But it actually solved a more fundamental problem. You have never, ever, 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 ever wanted to buy a smartphone. You've never, ever, ever wanted to buy a computer or any electronic device. You've never wanted to buy one. What you wanted to buy is what those devices can do, not the device. What you wanted to buy was a device that you could watch videos on or do your work on or do email or do surf the internet. That's what you wanted to buy. And any device that would fill those needs, you would buy. If you could buy an orange from the, from the grocery store to fulfill those needs, you'd buy an orange. You don't want to buy a computer. You want to buy what it can do. So the genius of this design is that you could do this incredible thing. Trust me, it was incredible. You could take it out of the box. Trust me, it was this remarkable. You could take it out of the box, you could put it on a table, and you could press on. And it came on. And you could get to work within five minutes. Prior to that, most computers, you, you had to download, upload an operating system, pull your hair out, you know, threatened to you know, do all sorts of nasty things to the customer service because people thought they wanted to buy a computer. What you want is what a computer can do, like any device. It's what it does. That's the problem people want solved, not the device. So what is the problem people want solved? Another way to supersize and power, make your, your questioning powerful is get to the root cause of the problem. Most of us, we have a tendency to solve the superficial questions, the superficial questions of what bubbles up to the surface. Right? That's what we all do. Bubbly, bubbly, bubbly. The simple things. But actually what you want to do is dig down. Why is that happening? And get down to the root cause. What is really happening? What is the real problem I need to solve? Just like Einstein said, a better problem is a better solution. Here's a simple, humble way to do this. Ask five questions, why questions, in a row. Simply ask five why questions in a row. So why do we do that? Oh, that's the way we do it. Okay. And why do we do it that way? Oh, that's in the policy. Okay. And why is it in the policy and why is it written that way? Oh, that's how people liked it written. Okay, and why did people like it written like that? Oh, that's because Bob liked it written that way. And why did Bob like it written that way? And where is Bob? Oh, he's retired. If you dig down, you find the root cause of the problem, the underlying, the bowel movements of the problem, the real guts of the problem. That helps you solve the profound problem, not the superficial. 
Another one is to simply watch people. Like I said before, and when you have your questions, see their journey, see the pain points in their journey. See where they have the most pain. And what is pain? You can express pain. You don't understand pain. It's those emotions, those horrible emotions. You can actually see it in their eyes. You can see it in their face. You can see it in their expression. You can see it in the words. What do you do when you're frustrated? Really? Speak nicely? If you match when you're frustrated, it's often where the product, the service, the design fell apart. There's a gap. Where there's a gap, there's an opportunity to improve. The next one is this, getting the right question. And it really amplifies what Einstein says, the right question. A question that expands and explodes your possibilities, not narrows them. Let me give you a real problem. Around the world, about 20 million babies are born premature. I think it's actually 200 million babies are born premature every year. About 4 million of them should be 200, not 20. 200 million babies are born premature, and about 4 million of them die. In wealthy countries like Canada and Western countries and other developed countries, what do we do? We put a premature baby into an incubator. It's a warm box with lots of gadgets that monitor this very frail infant until they're able to sustain themselves and leave the incubator. Okay? That's what we do. 200 million babies are born, 4 million die every year. But these incubators, they can cost anywhere from 30, 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars. They're expensive pieces of kit. Now that's way out of the budgets of many humbler nations. Right? Can't afford that. So the engineering question the engineering question is then the su subject matter expert question, is how do we build a cheap incubator? So you get the incubator, you take all the whistles and gadgets, the connectivity, the stuff, you get all the stuff, and you can build a cheap incubator made for a couple thousand dollars with basic functionality. A couple thousand dollars still might be too much for many jurisdictions. And here's the Achilles heel. It requires power. Many developing nations suffers from brownouts, electricity losses. When the electricity goes out, you just end up with a plastic box. So the danger of a narrow question, an engineering, a specialty question, is how do we build a cheap incubator? Narrow question. Possibilities like this. Narrow. The opposite is to think about something which is explosive. A question that is explosive and literally makes the opportunities limitless. An easy way to do this is to root your question in the experience, the customer experience, the person it's meant to be for. Root it, the question from their perspective, not the, not the technology and how we narrow it. Root it from their perspective. So the question is not how do we build a cheap incubator. It's how do we keep a baby warm? Isn't that the point? How do we keep a baby warm? And suddenly you have a question which explodes the possibilities. Because there's a thousand ways to keep a baby warm, isn't there? And it's not just an incubator. So what I want you to do is look at your hand, your left hand, right hand, somebody else's hand. I don't care. If you're on virtually online, you can look at your own hands. You can look Somebody else. Just look at your hand. Left or right, doesn't matter. Hopefully you got two. Okay. If you're wearing a watch or a bracelet or anything like that, a premature baby is about that size. Literally from, from your fingertip to your watch, roughly, a premature baby is about that size. That's a human being, just like you, but that size. Let me ask you a question. How do you keep that part of your human body warm in winter? Gloves. Interesting. So somebody was thinking about this, this explosive question, and they thought about gloves. Because that is the size of this frail human body. And we already do keep a part of a human body warm with gloves. And so this amazing company, there was a great TED talk, it's called Embrace. It's definitely something you should check out. They designed this little, almost, almost like a, a sleeping bag, 
built with glove technology and other things that keeps a baby warm. You could adjust, there's even elements I think you can put in to adjust the temperature. The company's called Embrace. Amazing CEO. Real inspiration. They've saved millions of babies around the world. Cost is about 25 bucks. But you see the power of an expansive question rooted in the customer, the person's experience, not the narrow question. So with that, we're going to do a little bit of a breakout session for two or three minutes, building on what you did before, building on what you did before. And what I would like you to do is think about what you think the problem statement is around re-engagement, coming back as a community, coming back as a call. What do you think the problem statement is we're trying to solve? Some people have talked about understanding community. Some people have talked about distance. Some talk, talked about maybe concerns around being other people. What do you think the problem statement is? I'm going to give you about two or three minutes. Sounds good? I take it that was agreement. It was a, a marginal nod. Okay, marginal nods I'll take. For those people online, it's the same thing. Think about something which, you know, the problem is saying, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Okay, let's come back together because I know you want to get out of here on time. You do, don't you? Can't stand me anymore. So what do you think the problem statement is? We have one statement from one of the groups online, which is how do we make it enticing and exciting to come back on campus and re-engage? So how do we make it worthwhile after being on remote and online? That's one problem statement. It doesn't matter if we have multiple problem statements. They're all valid. Anyone else? Want to put that ore into the sea and give it a go. Go ahead. Okay. So how do we actually like solve the problem of, social, of socialization between students and student groups? So people maybe aren't isolated when they come back on campus. Maybe they have. Maybe the, their friend group has graduated. Who knows? So again, ways we can actually help people socialize and bring people together. At the back. OK. OK.
Okay, so there's two pieces of that. One is understanding like people's like peer group, which they socialize with, right? And on, the next can be which is a subtle point, which is we've learned stuff over the last two years. Who thought this was going to be a one week wonder? Really? And they, they will. T anyone who t does the science of habits and forming habits will tell you: thirty days is when you can make a habit. Ninety days is when you really make that habit and set it in stone. People have ways of acting now, ways of interacting that they've actually become their operating system. So if you really want to bring people together, you have to understand that we have to, in some ways, change, break habits to come back together and socialize again and be subtle about how we bring people back together. Anyone else? Go ahead. Okay. Okay, so the, the opportunity then is to think about blended approaches so people can slowly move back onto campus by having a blend option of online versus in-person, eventually getting to all in-person if that's what you wanted. But you can see defining the problem helps you then come up with solutions that literally cascade out of that solution. Again, root the problem in the person and explode the possibilities. Sure. Totally. So how do we engage people by making it more exciting, dynamic, interesting, just like this session? So I, I totally get that. You have to be induced and enticed to be part of something. You have to make that desirable, that people want to go towards it and actually change potentially habits of what they've developed. You have to make the outcome more desirable. So definitely, engaging, exciting is utterly critical. So when we've come through that problem saying, refining the problem, now we can give you the business of ideation, coming up with amazing amounts of ideas. I'm going to give you some tips, though, of when it does and doesn't work. But the key is this. You have to come up with lots of ideas. Some are good, some are bad, and some are downright ugly. That's okay. They're all ideas. Sometimes ideas have their time and place. Sometimes ideas don't make any sense. Sometimes it's worth putting all your ideas, all your funds into the basket of the wild card, the wild idea. We haven't done it before. Let's do it. So again, it's about creating enormous amounts of ideas. Here's a humble way to think about this. I want you to stand up. Trust me, you know, it's not going to be anything painful. Just stand up. If you're at home, you can stand up too. What I want you to do is put your hands by your, hands by your sides. You ready? Put your hands in the air. And then I want you to bring your hands down to your sides. And then I want you to bring your hands up again. You can put some more enthusiasm in if you want. You can do this at home. Just bring them down again and up again. I want you to put your hands in the air and shake them in a manic fashion. Okay, what you have just done, aside from getting out of the energy sucking devices known as seats, is you've gone through a design process of ideation. A real design process of ideation is coming up with all of the possibilities we can. And then through a process of kind of, you know, thinking whether it works, doesn't work, is possible, you come up with a converge with a series of ideas that actually might work. What most organizations, teams, people do is they do, do you like it? No. 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 And no one ever goes anywhere because you don't embrace the full spectrum of what you can achieve. Ideation is more than just brainstorming. It's exploding the possibilities. Sit down. So if you wanted that in a graph, because people like diagrams and graphics, it's as simple as this. Diverge the possibility, explode them. Explore some good ideas, and then conferred, converge on something that actually matters. Explode, 
explore, and converge. It's a simple, humble way of doing it, just like you did with your hands. It's as simple as that. And when you think about that, let's talk about that first step. It's about diverging. How open is your aperture? How big is your pipeline of ideas? We are all victims of groupthink. We are all victims of legacy. We're all victims of what the person next to us thinks. How many times have you stifled an idea because you didn't think people would accept it? It might have been the best idea in the room. Now, typically what people do is brainstorming. Oh, pray to the brainstorming. This tool of everyone's going to sit in a room, we're going to give them stuff, and we're going to brainstorm. What really doesn't work? Have you ever been to a brainstorming meeting? It was kind of flat. I can tell you why nine out of ten brainstorm meetings go flat. The missing ingredient is not the ideas. People, by the way, try to bring inducements, coffee, and to spark people up. It doesn't work. The missing factor in most brainstorming ideation sessions is energy. As the leader, as the innovator in the room, and you'll all be innovators and leaders, you are responsible for the thermostat of energy, excitement, and enthusiasm in the room. People will build off your energy and enthusiasm. If you're excited about ideas, they will become excited about ideas. And they will offer more ideas. And if you build on the excitement and enthusiasm of ideas, they will come up with more ideas. If you stop ideas, make them, we're not going to do that, we're not going to do that, people will not feel they will edge back and not offer. It is your job as the innovator to create an environment of energy, enthusiasm, and excitement for what we can do. What can we possible? Hey, John, you said this. Hey, Mohammed, you said this. Could we go take that into even further? Could we go wilder with that idea? It is your job to bring the energy to the ideation process. Your job. Don't leave it to the person next to you. They won't. If you've ever been in a library or a building or, 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 and the one team on a table decides to talk a little louder and the group next to them, as a result, talks a bit louder and the first people next to them talk a bit louder and before you know it, 10 minutes later, everybody's talking really loud. Chain reaction. You ever been to a wedding and there's that strange, weirdy couple that go on the dance floor first? And everybody looks at them and points to them and says, oh, they're a bit odd. Look how they're dancing. And then there's another couple and another couple, more people, more people. And 20 minutes later, you can't get on the dance floor. Be the energy in the ideation process and dance first. That's all I'm suggesting. Dance first. Okay. This is a wonderful. This is Roger's elephant, Ship Shepherd's Roger's elephant. It's essentially an optical illusion. What I want to know is, how many legs does this elephant have? How many legs do you see this elephant has? You shout it out. Don't hold back. How many legs? Four. There's always a traditionalist in the room, and it's going to be four. Oh, there you go. Four? Who else? Does everyone see four? Nine? Strange elephants, you know. You see five? Five-legged elephants. Interesting. Oh, now you see five. Okay, now you've changed your mind. Anyone else? The point of this exercise is humbly this. Humbly this. Just because you see a problem, an idea a certain way, it doesn't mean the person next to you sees the same problem in the same way. Somebody can see the elephant's got five legs, somebody sees six, someone says, sees nine. We all come with our perspectives and our experiences that inform how we see the problem and how we develop ideas. As the innovator, you need to embrace that spectrum and say, how many legs does the elephant have? Does it really have five, six, or seven? Does it matter? People come with their different perspectives. They see the problem differently. Okay, what I want you to do, left hand or right hand, I am totally agnostic. I want you to raise your hand. Let's say left hand. Let's just do left hands. You can do this at home. Raise your left hand, high as you can. Okay, can you, can you raise it a bit higher? Of course you can. 
Why do, put your hands down now. Don't worry. It was that painful. Everybody holds back at the first go. When I asked you to raise your hand as high as you go, you thought, maybe this is good enough. Every kind of brainstorming session you've ever been in, people hold back their hand. They don't reach as high as they could go. Your job is to push them further and actually ask the wild questions that spark and stimulate them. Ask them to go even further and reach a bit higher. That's the good stuff up there. But most people hold back because they don't want to be, you know, don't want people to think, odd, think they're a bit odd or their ideas aren't good enough. It's, let's be honest, innovation happens at the margin, never in the middle. It's over here in the margins not in the middle. If you want to see the future, there's a great quote, I've forgotten. The future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. If you want to see what the future looks like, go to the margins of any sector, society, whatever. There are people doing things that everybody will do tomorrow. There are people living off the grid. And, I'm not, and some of them might be a bit wacky and weird, but I bet you there are things they're experimenting with which will be in every home in 10 or 15 years' home time. Go to the margins, never the middle, to find what the great ideas may be. Understand, you can always reach higher. So, last thing is this, when I think about ideas. What's your wild card? Have a wild card. What if we throw out all the assumptions and did something weird and radical like this? Allow people to play a wild card. Because again, most people will self-edit, self-censor their opportunities, their ideas, and give people the wild card to play, to explode those possibilities. Because you can only explore the good stuff if you've got good stuff to explore. It's as simple as that. You can only explore the good stuff if you've got good stuff to explore. So unless you have the good stuff, the wild cards... I bet you when someone thought of, let's design a little sleeping bag for babies, people thought, that's a useless idea. Why would you go that? Let's design a cheap incubator. Sometimes the wild stuff actually matters. It's the margins brought to the middle. So what I want you to do back in your groups is you had some ideas about what to do, how to overcome the engagement. I want you to ideate as many pos ideas as possible. Come up with 10, 20, I don't care. They Good, bad, ugly, it doesn't matter. And explore one or two in the group. Just explore one or two. Sounds good? Same on online. Come up with a bunch of ideas and explore one or two. Just flesh them out a little bit. Get a sense of what they feel like. Take them for a test drive. Three minutes.
Okay, everyone, let's come back together. I know it says seven minutes, but I'm just being mean. That's who I am. And it's going to be, it was about three. So let's see what you came up with. Trust me, sometimes time does not give you better ideas. It just gives you more time. So we had some ideas from online. Just going to deal with it. They talked about extra reunions. They talked about examples about wellness and yoga. They talked about how we reintegrate people around thinking about mental health and those kinds of questions. They've talked about other events, dynamic events. What did you come up with? At the back. Okay. 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 Okay, so basically what you're saying is let's put on our spandex pants and open up the buffet of events. And who goes to a buffet and just samples the broccoli? Really? Anybody? Come on, you gorge yourself, you load onto that plate. And you load different events for different people. Understand what they were. Maybe you can survey. Maybe you can canvas people in different ways. But have a range of events for different people with different interests to engage them differently. Let's get the buffet table out and not just offer them the sandwich. Anyone else? Go ahead. social cause. Okay, so the comment for those people online was essentially not just think about fun entertaining events, but how do we actually have events, exercises, activities that have a social impact, it could be around the environment, sustainability, it could be around social issues, economic issues, wherever it being, so people can get involved to have an, a positive impact in their community. Anyone else? This is the finger pointy thing, like, no, you say it, no, I say it, no, you say it. What did you come up with? Okay. Okay, so the two ideas from that table were competitions. People are very competitive. How do we get people back in to being competitive and together? And unstructured social groups to get people back socializing in different ways, unstructured ways. Anything else from online? Okay, family dinners for students who can't go home for their families. Okay. Anything else? No worries. Movie nights. Oh, who doesn't mind popcorn? Okay. Okay, so movie nights. But you can see there's a whole s slew of ideas by just opening up ap aperture. If you had more time, you could have more ideas. Now, the next real piece to this when you come along is ask yourself, well, and this is, again, it's part of the design process. When you've opened up the aperture, the funnel, you have to have some way to sort the funnel so we come back to converge. Because you can't do a thousand things, you can do a few things really well. So one of the ideas, again, from IDEA was like, how do we actually sort through what is a good idea versus something which is ugly? 
And essentially it's this. Is it desired? Do people want it? It's pointless doing something, building something, manufacturing something, having a service that people don't want. Do people desire it? Do people actually want it? Remember, we go back to my original definition. Ideas turned into action, creating value. Do people value this and want it? If they don't want it, why do actually do it? Two, is it viable? Can we do it right now? Can we afford it? Can we, do we have the people who can put that on? Is it viable within the technology we have? Viable. Can we actually do it? You know, everybody gets a rocket ship and a limousine. Probably not viable. Is it feasible? Slightly different. Feasible, technologically feasible. Can we design apps that, are, that enable some of those socialization ideas or the unstructured conversations? Is it feasible within the technology constraints that we have and our capabilities to deliver them? And so when you come through that, it's almost like the filter that actually you push your ideas through, desirability, viability, and feasibility to actually make you come up with a few select ideas that you actually can go forward with and prototype. Simple process, just like I said with the hands. Expand, converge, and come up with a few. So the next little step with this, I'm going to skip this one, is realizing that this isn't just a linear process. Just in a linear process. You don't just kind of understand people and then you define the people, you ideate. No, you ideate, come up with ideas. And if you come up with an insight about people, you go back to the question, who are we really serving here? What is their needs? How do we rethink our problem statement? It's not a static process. It's a dynamic process. You jump back, hopscotch back to the previous step if it still haven't got clarity. So... Oh, there we go. Look at that. All oh, lovely graphics. So let's move on to prototyping. Prototyping is essentially this. Nothing works first time around. Trust me, nothing works first time around. There's always a point of learning in the journey. Coming up with something, you learn. It has things that don't work, things that work really well. You come up with the journey. That's prototyping. The art of prototyping is to embrace failure. It's as simple as that. If you don't embrace failure, don't be an innovator. If you don't embrace failure, you won't actually prototype anything. By definition, your first version of it will be kind of garbage. But that's okay. Because you learn to improve upon it. And sometimes people have literally modeled apps and cell phones with cardboard and sticky glue. Or they've put it up on walls to map it out. It doesn't matter. Your first version will always be generally kind of terrible. It's, but it's a beautiful thing because it is your first version. The question is, what did you learn from it? What can you improve from it? But you have to be willing to embrace failure and be, be joyful in your failure. One of the issues, if you go into IDOs, there, there, uh, there's a documentary about them. They have a whole hallway of all of their useless products they've designed. All the things that didn't work. And they're proud of them. Look at this. This was a terrible idea we came up with. It didn't work at all. It was lousy. But, and they're very proud of their failure. Rather than saying that it was shunt, we're going to hide it away. They're proud of the failure. So prototyping is about the joy of failing, failing fast. The other piece of this is about rapid pro prototyping. Think it up. Use a piece of paper, even if it's technology. Sketch it out. Sketch out what its functionalities could be, how it will look, what it will look like, how it will interact. Remember I told you about empathy is about understanding the sight, the touch, the feel, all of those things. Sketch it out rapidly. Come up with the idea. Is this good enough? Would you buy this? Is this, is this effective? Would you use this? Rapid prototyping helps you get there. Because you can work out the kinks, the bugs, the whatever, before you spend a lot of money trying to develop something special. You can sketch. I do believe powerfully in sketching. You can use technology to sketch, but sketch down what it is. What does it look like? How does it feel? You can storyboard, which is basically designing a cartoon strip. Really powerful if you're coming up with an experience. Here's the customer. This is what they do. This is how we treat them. And this is the end product. They're really happy. <laughs> Design the storyboard. 
tell the story of your innovation and how it impacts people's and changes their lives. The other one is mock-ups. You can actually, this is a great uh, slide here, of people who literally made paper smartphones with the apps. Just a, th a rough sketch of what it would look like, how it would act. How much do you think it cost them? Pennies? But again, you overcome humble challenges early. You overcome hurdles and barriers to use early by using sketches, mock-ups, whatever you can. Come up with colored pens. You can use post-its. You can use whatever. You can use cardboard. You can use all those beautiful craft skills you haven't used since you were a kid. Really. It's amazing how we stamp out our creativity early because we think now we're adults. We're adults, we're serious people. Who is it here as a serious person? An adult, a serious person? We stamp out creativity. If you give a bunch of five-year-olds colored pens, cardboard, and God knows what else, they will come up with amazing things. Give a bunch of like executives the same things, and they just sit there looking stern. Which is the more creative? It's about adding the element of play into what you do. And again, that will, by the way, neurology will tell you this, what is, what is wired together works together. It'll actually spark more creativity in your mind. So if you have those technologies, you can do 3D printing, beautiful technologies, just to figure something out, just to figure out what it might look like, what it might interact. Is it perfect? No. Does it give you an idea, an impression? And by the way, something you can use to influence others that your idea is better than maybe the, the current offering. It gives you an, an impression of what the final product is. It's a prototype, not the perfect type. But do it quickly, do a lot of it. You can do it as a team, as a group, it doesn't really matter. Again, when you think about prototyping, go all the way back to the person. Always think about how you're walking in their shoes, seeing through their eyes. Go back to the beginning. So. So, what I would like to do in this last breakout session, we have a little bit of time, we're going to do this, is what I would do is maybe you have an idea that you already had. Maybe it's a fresh idea, something else has sparkled down from the heavens. Prototype it. How would you make it happen? How would you make your idea happen? Because if it doesn't happen, it's just an idea. So how would you make it happen? How could you make it happen? in terms of prototyping it, having a dummy run, a test drive, a you know, dress rehearsal. How would you make it happen? I'm going to give you about four minutes. Sounds good? That was a yes, I take it. My, my mind reading skills are really poor. I've tried for years, but my mind reading skills are poor. Four minutes, here you go.
come back together for the last time and see your brilliance in action. This is your Sistine Chapel moment. The masterpieces are always left for the end. So you had a chance to prototype, think about how you might want to do this, how you could do it. What did you come up with? What's your sparkles of brilliance right now? An airplane building contest. That's amazing. That sounds cool. Well, there you go. You had built an air paper airplane. Oh, it's good. But again, interactive design. There's a whole experience about how you actually then, you can take that and improve the way you design a paper airplane and make it competitive and tell lessons around com uh, competition, interaction, teamwork. There's cool things you can do just with humble things. Anyone else? Go ahead. Sorry? Clay modeling. Okay, so you can use materials like clay to actually, actually build, this, build something, fabricate something, as well as the actual experience. Okay, anyone else? Go ahead. Yeah, totally. So how do we use technology, social media, to act as that polling system that understands where people, what people want, and cluster people around interests so we can actually offer services, offer engagement around those? Anything from online that we should be know, know about? Any other tables? Anything else that you'd like to prototype? Last chance to speak. Speak now if I ever hold your peace. Anything else from online? No. Okay. Let's go to the last step, which is test. You can prototype. You can build all the things in the lab you want, but ultimately they've got to see the cold light of day. You've got to test them with people. Test them with the people you thought were going to use your product or service. These are the users. How do they are going to interact with it might be very different from how you interact with it. And by the way, be careful of subject matter experts versus the real user. I remember going to um, a session with a bunch of hospitals. And they, what they do is they have hospital beds. These are very expensive because they move and do all these dynamic things. They move about. And... Basically, they get all the bed designers to come in. It looks a little bit like a bed showroom with all the beds, all the hospital beds. And all of the doctors and nurses walk around the beds and press all the buttons to make the button things move and stuff. And they got a patient experience committee to come in. And they did something that the salespeople, the nurses and doctors have never done. Do you know what it was? They got on the beds. They got on the beds to see how comfortable they were. Because it never occurred to the doctors and the nurses and the salespeople of these fancy beds to lie on their beds, just like you would in any like showroom with beds, to see how comfortable it is. Because the patient's experience is lying in that bed for 24 hours, 36 hours, 48 hours or longer. It's not something they work around. It's something they lie upon. So again, testing it with the people who actually use your product. So this is the point where you think about being iterative, actually trying it again and again and again until you get it right, knocking out the kinks, knocking out the bugs, finding what works, what doesn't work, right? Go back to the entire process. When you think about testing, go back to define your problem. Maybe you ideate again what worked. If it didn't work, was it a small thing that we missed? that we didn't include, a small functionality that we didn't include, which was the missing functionality. Remember my example, did you ever really want to buy a computer? Really? Or did you want to buy what a computer can do? Because maybe there's an act and a function that you wanted that you can't get on that platform. That's the missing jigsaw puzzle piece that creates the value that people want to see. So again, go back to define your problem and idea. It is an a dynamic process, an iterative process. 
Don't stop just because you get to the end. Go back, start again, figure it out, test again. As I said, ultimately, it's about people. You're designing for people from literally from the shoes up of how people use your, your product, your service, your device. It doesn't matter. Think about people always. Think about their empathy questions, you know, the, the head, the logic, the heart, and the gut feeling, the gut responses. Think about all those senses we talked about. All of them matter. Ultimately, the testing period is a learning period. Learn from what you have done. Learn from what worked and didn't work. Because there's always things that work, they're really successful. What didn't work can actually be as profound an insight as what didn't work. Think about barriers. Go back to people and think about barriers. Why can't people still have this thing or this experience or this community? Why is the barriers of the people engaging still? Is it an economic barrier they can't afford it? Is it a social or a cultural barrier where they can't use this device or they've never used this device? What are those barriers? If you don't understand the barriers, you're not going to be successful Whatever, however beautiful thing you design. Understand people's barriers, reduce the barriers, move around the barriers, and design for them, not for the just generally a product. To leave you with this, I'm going to tell you a story. It's a tale of two motorcycle companies. It's, it kind of embodies a lot of things that we've talked about. The first one is Harley Davidson. You've all heard of them, I take it. Big American motorcycle company, iconic, made big, beautiful, expensive motorcycles. Right, highly profitable company, but they have had pretty much declining sales over the last 10 years or so. One of the reasons, not the only reason, one of the reasons is their bikes are very, very expensive. What does that mean? Their rider demographic, the user, the people, tend to be baby boomers, empty nesters who now have the money to buy an expensive motorcycle. Right? They've got gray hair. Right? It's an aging demographic. So the question is, how are you encouraging new customers when your current customer base, by definition, is actually shrinking? They're affluent, and you design for them. How do you do that? So and the opposite of this is Royal Enfield. It was an English company that was now built to make the motorcycles in India. Interesting. So many things has long heritage. They've got technology and techniques from they brought from all over the world, and they brought high. I think. This is the managing director, who I think is it's still the managing director, to the heart of Lao. Really interesting guy. Does he look like an executive? He looks like a dude could do with a bottle of shampoo, if you ask me. But he's a fabulous guy. And do you know why? He rides his products. He rides motorcycles. He rides a motorcycle to work. He insists that many of the executives ride the motorcycle they make to work. And he goes out and meets people who own his motorcycles and say, what do you think? What can we do better? What can we improve? He talks to the people who use his products and say, how can we design these products better? And as a result, they have a motorcycle, a range of motorcycles. They've ramped their entire kind of line. I think they're selling like a million motorcycles a year, one of the fastest selling motorcycles in the world. It's very economical, price point, barriers to entry, money, even here, it's very economical. So new riders can afford it. Can't afford a Harley, but they can afford one of those bikes. Understand your barriers, know your customer, walk in their shoes, understand how you can remove those barriers. So, empathy, understand, understand. The last thing is this. This is my last point before we close up shop today. If you really want to get into this business of design thinking, you've got to be in the dream business. Just not solving little niche problems. The companies that do it really well sell dreams, not things. You buy things, commodities, but you will invest in wonderment, in dreams. Dreams sell big. But to understand dreams, you've got to understand people. Right? I never met a chair that had dreams. I met people that have dreams. 
And we have different kinds of aspirations. One of the greatest companies, I think, that extols this is IKEA. Anybody like IKEA in the room? You will love or hate it. It's a passion. IKEA. IKEA, let's be honest, what does it sell? What does it actually sell? And by the way, it has some of the best-selling product of all time. There's a thing called the Bully, I think it's the Billy Bookcase, and it's sold like hundreds of millions of these around the world. Literally, they're in apartments from Tokyo to California to Al Algeria. What does IKEA sell? It sells flat pack furniture. That's what it sells. That doesn't very sound very inspiring, does it? Flat pack furniture. What IKEA does, and it's real brilliance and magic, is it sells you dreams of your future state. It shows you a dream of what your apartment, your house will look like. It's going to look that good. And when you go to them, there's a big serpentine throughout the store, and you've gone in there to buy, I don't know, a lamp. And you think, oh, but my lamp looks, and then it's my lamp in its natural habitat with that sofa and that chair and that rug. In its natural habitat looks wonderful. I want that. Because it sold you a dream, an aspiration of a future state. You came in for a lamp, you left with a couch and a rug and a God knows what else, and a strange plant you didn't think you would buy. In fact, you were so in love with your dream, get this. They turn you into a free warehouse schlep at the end, and you have to manhandle your sofa and bed and things by yourself. Honey, it's going to look lovely when we get it home. Nobody helps you. You do the, their warehousing for you. And why? Because you're in love with the dream. They've sold you a dream of what your home would look like, and they follow through. They're not selling flat pack furniture. Aspirations of a future state, just like the motorcycle, what you will feel like on that motorcycle, what you will feel like. It's the emotional, it's, you know, it's the head, yes, but it's the heart and the gut. They sell dreams. So when you think about design thinking in its essence, think about dreams. Now, the other great genius of IKEA is its instructions. Its instructions. Brilliant. They're a cartoon strip. I bet you if those were written instructions, put P6B against point six B A and screw it in at a vertical angle, you would give up. You might already still give up because that little Allen key. But think about it. They don't need to trans. These are the same instructions they have in, I don't know, Australia, the same instructions they have in Thailand, the same instructions they have in Eastern Europe. Because you don't need to translate a picture, you have to translate words. And actually, words are complex. Pictures are easy to think. Now, I'm not really sure why they suggest you be naked, bring a friend around, and build furniture, but it is a Swedish company. It's just that kind of way of doing things. It's a thing. But that's, again, they sell dreams, and they sell it to you in an easy way that you can achieve your dreams. So let's look at this process one more time. It is simply this, empathy. Know the people you're designing for. Know how they think, they act, they feel, all of those senses. Define your problem. Ideate. Come up with lots of ideas. The breadth of your treasure chests depends on the ideas you have. Think about how you would prototype. Test them. Come up with a clumsy version of it. But hey, does it work? Does it feel right? Test something and go through the process again. It is a dynamic process. What I've tried to do in this... Oh, oh, oh humble session is to take you through those steps and introduce you to how you can inject these steps into the way you see the world. Trust me, you will see so many barriers and ways to improve things. But again, always walk in your customers, the patient, the person's shoes. Design and think from their eyes. I'd like to thank the um, Fanshawe FSU for help hosting us today and all the people involved in the Innovation Day and making this a remarkable session. Do you have any comments, leaving comments? Could be ugly, bad, I don't care. You can throw stones at me if you wish. Go ahead. Oh, okay. That's a great question. So how, I'll, I'll answer by this is 
I designed this presentation as a storyboard. You don't actually write out what you're going to say. You storyboard the word with pictures and imagery because we don't always speak what we write. We actually understand pictures. So it's almost like a cartoon strip. So I've learned the skill of storyboarding what I'm going to say and the cartoon, the story, and that helps me tell the story of what I'm going to present, if that helps. Any other last questions? Any last questions of all? Can I get an extra donut? The answer is yes. Okay, so I, with that, is there any other comments from the online? Anyone? Anything? Anyone? Okay. If you want to talk to me afterwards, happy to do so. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for staying for the entire session. And that is it, the end. I hope you enjoyed it.